Welcome to lecture seven. In this lecture, we will discuss the entropy as well as the second and third laws of thermodynamics in order to apply them to chemical systems to determine if the process is spontaneous. This lecture will be presented in four pieces. In the first part, entropy will be defined as well as what it means for a process to be spontaneous. Next, the second law of thermodynamics will be given and several examples of changes in entropy will be shown. Then the third law of thermodynamics will be defined. And finally, we will combine the second and third laws to apply standard molar entropy to chemical reactions to determine if a process is spontaneous. Entropy, typically denoted as a capital S, is defined as the Boltzmann constant times the natural logarithm of W, where W is the number of microstates in a given macrostate. A lot of reference material defines entropy as a measure of disorder. A better simile is that it is a measure of uncertainty, since it is not usually known which microstate the system is in. The uncertainty is quantified as the number of states that a system can occupy given a total energy for the system. One example calculating entropy for a system uses our three molecule example with a total energy of three. Since there is one microstate for macrostate one, then the entropy for macrostate one is the Boltzmann's constant times the natural logarithm of one, which is equal to zero. There are six microstates for macrostate two, so the entropy for macrostate two is, is the Boltzmann's constant times the natural logarithm of six. And there were three microstates for macrostate three. Thus, the entropy for macrostate three is Boltzmann's constant times the natural logarithm of three. This means that the second macrostate for this system has the highest entropy, it follows that it is the most uncertain since it has the most microstates. On the other hand, there is no uncertainty for macrostate one since there is only one microstate. Now, entropy is used to define if a process is spontaneous. This is in contrast to enthalpy where if a process is exothermic or endothermic, our properties typically used to describe if a process is favorable. This transfer of heat at constant pressure does not, however, indicate if a process will happen or not. That is what it means for something to be spontaneous. In other words, a spontaneous process is a process that has a tendency to occur without work needing to be done. In contrast to this, a non-spontaneous process is one that can only happen by doing work. Bear in mind that the spontaneity of a process has nothing about the rate at which it occurs. We also intuitively know what it means for a process to be spontaneous. One example is a gas expanding to fill a volume. What is not spontaneous is all the gas particles moving to one corner of the box. That won't typically happen unless work is put into the system to move all of the gas particles there. Another example is that of a plate shattering, which can be seen by following the link in the slide. It is not spontaneous for all the pieces of the plate to come back together and form the plate. So here is what we know about entropy and spontaneity. Entropy is a measure of the order of magnitude of the number of microstates in a given macrostate. Each microstate is equally likely, therefore the macrostates with more microstates are more probable to be observed. So, systems will tend to move towards macrostates with higher entropy as they will naturally find these macrostates randomly. This means that spontaneity and entropy are linked since processes which increase entropy are spontaneous. In other words, entropy is time zero, where we associate increasing entropy with time moving forward. This idea is in fact the second law of thermodynamics, which states that the entropy of an isolated system tends to increase. One way to quantify this statement as an equation is to define a change in entropy, since this is the quantity that tends to be positive. It can be written as delta S is equal to Q reversible divided by T, where the heat transfer, or Q, is used, instead of, for example, work because a quantity that describes chaos should be quantified with a transfer of energy that quantifies random motion. Q-reversible means that the heat is transferred in small packets and dispersed evenly. Temperature in the denominator takes into account the entropy already present for a system at a specified temperature. And entropy is a state function, so it's path independent. Let's do a quick example where we calculate the change in entropy using this definition. So in this example, we're talking about a reversible transfer of 100 kilojoules of heat into a large mass of water at 273 Kelvin. And so going back to our definition of entropy, we have the change in entropy is equal to the reversible change in, or the transfer of heat divided by the temperature. And so I can basically just write in 
the terms that are given in the problem, 100 times 10 to the 3, because I'm going to express this in joules, divided by 273. And so then the answer would be 366 joules per Kelvin. Let's now look at the case of isothermal expansions of gases. Recall for the isothermal, being no change in temperature, expansion of an ideal gas, that the work is equal to the negative heat transferred. Since the work is equal to negative nRT times the natural logarithm of the final volume divided by the initial volume for an isothermal reversible expansion, then the change in entropy is equal to n times r times the natural logarithm of the final volume over the initial volume. Note that even though we used a reversible transfer of heat to find this relationship, the change in entropy is a state function. So, this result is valid for irreversible changes. Here is a quick example where we're going to examine the change in entropy due to expansions of gases. And so in this case, we're trying to find the change in molar entropy of a gas that is basically expanding isothermally to twice its initial volume. And we're going to do this in two steps, or in two parts, where we're first going to calculate if this process is reversible, and then we're going to find out what it means if it's irreversible. So in the first case, we're going to talk about reversible changes. We're saying our V final is equal to two times our initial volume. And if we go back to our definition of a change in entropy, that's equal to Q reversible over T. As we said in the previous slide, Q reversible is equal to the negative of the work that's performed. And we know that for an isothermal reversible expansion, the work that's performed is negative nRT times the natural logarithm of Vf over Vi. And that's divided by T. So in this case, my minus signs cancel out, my Ts cancel out. And what we're left with is, is this change in entropy term that we had shown in the previous slide, nR times the natural logarithm of Vf over Vi. So if we continue to calculate this value, well, since we're trying to find the molar entropy of this, then that means I can divide both sides by n, because that's what will give me a molar entropy on the left-hand side. And I'm left with now just the gas constant R times the natural logarithm of Vf over Vi. And since I know that Vf is equal to 2 times Vi, I can write 2Vi over Vi. And so now this cancels out my Vi's. And so what I'm left with is 8.3145 times the natural logarithm of 2. And what that's equal to is 5.76 joules per mole Kelvin. How is this different for an irreversible expansion? Well, in this case, since we know that delta S is a state function, what that means is that it's independent of the path that it takes to go from one state to the next. And since its state in this case is defined by the volume, then we know that the molar entropy change for the irreversible process is just going to be 5.76 joules per mole Kelvin.